Just in time for holiday gift giving, Dancio, the online dance instruction provider, has announced an expansion of its lineup of classes, teachers, and menu of subscriptions. Led by world renowned teachers, Dancio's library now includes over 100 classes in a wide range of dance and fitness genres, from ballet, modern, contemporary, and West African dance to yoga and body conditioning. Available in monthly and yearly subscriptions and a la carte individual classes, Dancio offers high quality instruction at affordable prices from the comfort of your own home or studio. Aspiring dancers of all ages can turn to Dancio to improve their technique, develop artistry, or simply participate in the joy of dance. Best of all, Dancio is run by dancers for dancers and makes a memorable holiday gift. To gift Dancio, go to dancio.com, that's D-A-N-C-I-O dot com, and click on subscribe. I'm Rebecca King Ferraro. And I'm Michael Sean Breeden, and you're listening to Conversations on Dance. On today's episode of Conversations on Dance, we are joined by author Jennifer Homans. Homans received critical acclaim for her 2011 book, Apollo's Angels, a historical documentation of ballet from its creation to the present day. She has spent the last 10 years working on Mr. B, a biography of George Balanchine that was published this November. We talked to Jennifer about the research process, her most fascinating finds, and what her final takeaways are from spending a decade getting to know the life of George Balanchine. Click the link in the description of this episode to get your copy of Mr. B. Jennifer, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time, and we just are so excited to delve into your new book, Mr. B. Thank you for having me. I'm very happy to be here. It's so funny. I was thinking that we normally start these interviews with somewhat a returning guest, and we say, what have you been up to since the last time we spoke with you? And in this (laughs) case, we're pretty sure we know (laughs) this amazing accomplishment of 10 years of dedication to this really interesting book. We'd like to just start to hear a little bit about the process, um, how the idea came about. And of course, there's so many books on Balanchine. How did you set out to create something totally different and that would set itself apart? Um, you know, I, I started thinking about it because I was I had, I had finished Apollo's Angels and um, I was sort of searching around for another project and I and I kept on thinking about Balanchine and I just couldn't get away from the subject. Every time I thought, oh, no, 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 I'm going to do something different. I'm going to do something about something not about dance. It's going to be a history project. And, and it just kept it, it just was so deep in me from my own experience and from you know, the impact that it made on my life, even when I was, I mean, I was just a teenager when I first experienced it and then seeing those works while he was still alive and studying with the people I did at the School of American Ballet and then being able to dance the works. And then um, I, I think I felt that I could add something to the already existing sort of library of books about Balanchine because it had been enough time. You know, he died in 1983, so it had been a couple of decades more. Um, and there was, so there, those books were not archival in a sort of mm-hmm. historical sense. And I felt that, you know, because I had trained as a historian, that both the time span and the resources were there. It was time to look back. We could see more clearly what it was and what had happened than people who were writing in the heat of the moment. Right. Yeah. yeah I mean, that's that's what sets the book apart for me. I've never read a book, I don't believe. And I, I mean, I'm a pretty voracious consumer of Balanchine Lit. You know, I, I feel like I've read them all. But it just to have something that was about, you know, the historical man, and it wasn't just dedicated to his genius or seen through the lens of someone who experienced his genius firsthand. And I'm kind of wondering why maybe it took so long in my head, because we have books like um, you know, about Robbins or Lincoln, um, Nijinska just last year, or maybe that was this year even. Uh, but, you know, like, mm-hmm. it, it seems to me that, um, like, it, it would have happened earlier. And and then I'm kind of curious why maybe it didn't. Do you, yeah, do you, have- you know, I don't have an easy answer for that. I, you know, I don't know. Um, I mean, there, as you as you mentioned, there were books that were written soon after his death. There were, there's been a sort of steady stream since then you know, not huge, but, um, yeah, you know, there's a, I mean, there's such a big story there. Number one, it's a huge subject to tackle. I have to tell you, I felt a little sick when I signed the contract because I was like, oh, this is going to be really hard, you know, and can I do it? 
can I do it? So maybe there's that, but and maybe there's also that there's there's been a a sort of uh, a, a steady myth industry around balance mm-hmm. too, mm-hmm. and right. it's hard to disrupt that. And um, it, it's understandable that there was, but I was in a position to have been there, and I had the historical background, and I had the dance background, so it just felt to me like okay, I could do something here that hasn't been done. And and maybe it just took time because he was such a huge figure. And when a huge figure like that dies, you know, there's a there's like a crater in the earth that you can't right. you can't just get in there right away. You have to wait until things start to settle a little right. bit. Mm-hmm. But then also you can't wait too long because we also don't want to lose these. Exactly. Right. And I did, you know, I a lot of people were still alive, but of course I missed people as well. Mm-hmm. And um yeah, I mean that was my first task. I made a list of the people, Alf- mm-hmm. uh, order of the, of birth. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, interesting. So I'm curious. Yeah. I wanted to dive into your extensive bibliography, and one of those um, ch- areas of the bibliography is who you spoke with. And like Michael and I were saying, it's like our dream list of guests of incredible people, <laughs> and we know that's not easy to get. So, what was that process like? Getting in touch with them. Um, setting up interviews? Was anyone a little hesitant? Did anyone say no way and then change their mind? Yeah, you know, there was all of that. I mean, I I really just cold called. And, you know, some people I knew, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I did web search, I did all the usual stuff, right? It's being a historian is a bit like being a, you know, a, a, a sort of detective. And you, you know, so I just used everything I could use to try to get to people. And, Mm -hmm. um, Usually the answer was, yes, I'd be happy to talk to you. And then the question was, how much am I going to tell you? You know, Right. Right. Which is so usually it was possible to get in the door. Not always. There were people who said, no, I don't really want to talk about this. And I'm not Mm going to go on record. Um, Right. You know, there were lots and lots of people who wanted to talk and who sort of poured forth their stories. And this was very moving to me because... I spoke with, you know, some 200 dancers or something like that. And it was, it was, it, it became a kind of immersive and almost obsessive thing for me. I mean, I was just, I was talking to people for hours. These were not short interviews. They were right. as long as people would give me, you know, and I didn't just ask them about balancing. I asked them about their whole lives. Like, how who were you? Because I felt that he knew that about them and I wanted to know it too. So yeah. I love that because you you talk about the way he knows people and it's like he knows who you're dating. He knows what you're drinking. He knows what, you know, what what, what your favorite lunch spot is. Exactly. Yeah. And so I, I love that you chose like to get to know him to also find that side of him through his dancers and, and in your interviews. That's so cool to me. Yeah. And you um, know, it became more and more important as I went. I mean, I'm, I am a historian. I thought I was going to do a ton of archival work, which I did, but I first did all of these interviews because they became more and more important. I kept going. I kept going. I was like, Oh boy, the years are going by, but I'm just going to keep going, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, because the, 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 I, it, I mean, it's why I called the book, Mr. B because really he was in a way he only ex- he existed mainly in the eyes of his dancers and in the mm-hmm. ways in which he worked with them and the ways that he they thought about him mm-hmm. so it became very important in terms of understanding the book and then also understanding you know his relationship to to his dancers and especially to women and right women that the dancers that he loved and the ways in which they talked about it. I came to see it as a kind of testimony uh, that mm. they were, because they, they, some of them, as you, as you mentioned, have written books, but not that many. And certainly the ones in the court of ballet and who weren't the famous stars, you know, have not written books mainly. Right. I'm, I'm curious how you got to um, the root of, I guess, truth for stories that have, so many different versions like for instance you cite at the end of the book a a a barbara horgan story well oh and then you know on his deathbed he said and we're gonna you know basically give the company to peter and these people were there and those people were like we weren't there Peter, you know that like how do you kind of sift through all of that to get through what you're going to publish in the book i mean i was careful i i tried to have you know two or three accounts of a of a of an incident before i used it 
Um, but of course, in some cases, these are very personal things that happen to people. Right. And, you know, I decided not, you know, in the beginning when I was writing, I was like identifying each speaker and it became like this sort of barrage of names and mm -hmm. people and it was confusing. And I just thought, you know, the general reader is not going to be able to follow this. And then it sort of turns into a gossip. And so I just... I, I I had talked to enough people that I felt confident in making judgments about what to include. And I did exclude many things as well, you know, that were told to me that I was sort of, well, not sure. Right. Mm. I, I love that you explain that because I had a, I, in my mind, I was questioning, I would be like, oh, this story where she says, okay, Balanchine did this with a dancer. I, I know who the dancer is personally, but you're like, you're thinking larger picture for someone that isn't just like that deep in the weeds with this whole Yeah, it didn't seem that, important. The point was, right. what, was it, what was his life and what was he right. like? What's inside him? I was trying to get inside him, and mm -hmm. you know, the testimony of the dancers was was a, was about doing that, uh, and because they were like almost an extension of him, they were a, a kind of they're just the key key figures in his life, you know. Besides uh, composers, which of course is the other key element, but the dancers, you know, those ballets don't exist without them. So. Mm -hmm. It became very, very important to to sort of understand their stories and their views, and and you know the the, the question about veracity is also just a, a constant nag for any anybody writing about the past. And you're you know mm -hmm. because memory and, and when you're using oral history, memory is notoriously it, memory memory does lie. You know, right? Not yeah, right. But it but you reinvent your memories every day, and mm -hmm. so. Know that what you're so I was also checking with written sources whenever I could, you know, with, with uh, diaries, letters. I always asked for those things. I was in a lot of basements and uh, attics and that kind of thing. So I was yeah. always trying to calibrate with the written word. Interesting. Right. Were there any dancers that either maybe weren't able to talk with you because they had passed on or any dancers that you asked to speak with that really you felt like there was something missing just because you wanted their account of the story. Was there anyone like that? I mean, hmm. you know, people were generous with me. I, I was given um, tapes of, of, of recordings of people that I had missed, you know, that I was either mm -hmm. too young to have known or to, uh, had started too late to have interviewed. Mm -hmm. uh, right. So I, I, I benefited from, from that kind of thing. I benefited from tapes of balancing that other people had, had made and, and interviews they had done that hadn't been published or weren't in libraries. So, yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that question really. I just, you were able to still put it all together. Yeah. 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 I'm curious at what point you um, realized or maybe you knew right away, but at what point travel became a big component of this book? What, when were you sort of setting out on these international trips that were going to put you in the moment of a of a place that meant something to Balanchine? Yeah, I mean, there were two kinds of travel. One was for archives, you know, and that was all pretty much all over, you know, it was in spots all over Europe and all over the U.S. and in and in Russia, of course, where I had um, help from a, a Russian historian and, and researcher, um, and in Georgia. So there was the, you know, the trip to the archive, but there was also the idea that it would be, and I got this from another biographer, um, actually from Robert Carroll, who had said to me, go and walk the walk the places if you have questions about what happened go and be there and see what you find and so i really i really thought that was kind of brilliant and so i started to do it and i was you know so i walked to st petersburg and i walked to you know copenhagen where he was with with tanaki leclerc when she was stricken with polio i walked um the streets of paris around his when he was there in the twenties, I got the addresses for the apartments. I walked up the mm -hmm. stairs and I saw the bar, you know, where it would be in the case of one or two, which still existed, the buildings were still there. So mm -hmm. that kind of thing seemed to me to be, it, it, it actually turned out to be important. And the trip to Georgia was crucial. Uh -huh. 
Right. At yeah. what point in your process did that happen? That happened um, mainly for just, you know, personal and family reasons. It happened sort of in the late middle, I would say. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't remember what year it was. It was mm-hmm. before the pandemic, thank God. But <laughs> yeah. that's another well, how do- Point. Yeah. How, did How did that, that pandemic play into? Yeah, I mean, the pandemic was a was a kind of. I mean, I was already writing by then because my process is I do the research, all of it, and then I write and I go back if I need to. But I try not to go back too much because by then, I've got so much that I can't even handle it all. You know? Right. Right. So, yeah, I'm sure. So the pandemic. I was already writing. I was already at the point where I wasn't doing any more research. But when the pandemic came, there was no choice, right? And right. there was so just a lot of time. <laughs> so right, it allowed you more time. That's yeah, it allowed me more time. I was, I, I pretty much, yeah, I didn't, I, I was at my desk long hours of the day, yeah. every day. Let's start <laughs> delving into yeah. the book itself and some of the incredible information that's in there. Michael and I were just so struck by especially his early life and how you really painted that picture in a way that we hadn't really seen before or read before. Tell us a little bit about that and why that was particularly important for you to introduce us to him in that way. You know, the early life is is um, sort of surprising in a way, you know, because it's, it's, it's not a, it's, there's not, there's nothing typical about it. It's a kind mm-hmm. of, it's all built on sand and it sort of dissolves in your hands as you're going. And mm-hmm. no, he's, he's illegitimate. The, the birth certificates are doctored later. The, um, mm-hmm. you know, just before he's born, his mother wins the lottery and suddenly they're rich having come from a very, very modest means. And his father was a composer, of course, and his mother, we know less about, um, but you know, the, suddenly they're living in these fancy places. And so he's born into wealth, which is very quickly squandered. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, the, that sort of, it's almost like, you know, it, I think sand is the, is the best thing I came up with. You know, it's almost like you're, you're in sand, you're swimming, you're, there's no where to touch ground that easily. And so mm-hmm. he found places to touch ground, which maybe he had to do with his mother and to do with his, with music and had to do with um, food and the house in Finland where, where he had happy memories. And I got a lot of this from tapes of him talking about it. Mm-hmm. Um, along with some of the information in Elizabeth Kendall's book about about the early life, which she mm-hmm. uh, uncovered some very interesting things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, that was the idea. Go ahead. Yeah. No, I, I was just going to say, like, it, but you just delve, you zoom out, and you you make such a richer portrait of it. Then I feel like a lot of these details, maybe I'd heard, you know, like feels like something you read in a book, like Balanchine just says offhand, you know, when I was you know 15 we ate rats in the street and that's it you know you're just like oh wow that's bad but like yeah. you know right. or like you know you i remember reading that they had won the lottery but it's just like a one one sentence thing in a much larger book that doesn't really go in and mm-hmm. instead you like the way that you it, it helps build who he would become as a choreographer all those um life experiences like you know you, with the way you talk about his experiences with the czar and like and has how being um you know sort of like worshipful of that versus the um you know the the revolution that was happening and uh like how that would impact his politics later on like it all d- connects to who he is as the choreographer and i just i couldn't even believe like you think you know enough about a person you've been you know, reading about and dancing their ballets for two decades. And it just made it so much more impactful than I could have ever thought. Yeah. I mean, look, for me, it became a kind of epic story. It's it's like a, and, you know, I tried to write it so that it had that, that breadth. I mean, it, it wrote itself that way because it is an epic story. It's an astonishing right. story. Yeah. And, and, and I also, you know, tried to sort of, fit him in his history so that mm-hmm. some of those, I mean, I, I, I hope that that's one of the ways that that had that effect for you. You know, when you're mm-hmm. reading, you feel like you understand it better. It's, I think it's partly because 
you're getting the, you know, it's like instead of just him, you're getting the mm-hmm. whole surround sound experience of what was going on there around him, even when he didn't know it. Right. Yeah. I thought that was particularly interesting when you were going into the history of the time and the political culture of the time when he was growing up and what was happening, because that helped set the scene for it and how he was, you know, insulated in the theater. And then I when we were reading then later about the 1960s in America, where there was so much change going on and how he did like a similar thing where he insulated himself in the theater, I just found it to be very interesting that there there were just so many parallels, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. Theaters can be very places that kind of swallow people. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. And and then just the parallels to what's happening now with ballet, you know, um, undergoing, there's a lot of upheaval and um, just kind of facing today's world. I mean, just something as simple as like, you know, flesh colored tights and how that can be like a hot button issue where people are like why is it why are we going to change now why is that you know why do we have to make it like this and and that balancing at the end of his life i guess i'm jumping all over the place but it's all it's also interesting but you know you ha- talk so um so in depth about how like suddenly he's not at the forefront anymore and he's like kind of struggling with the the change and like that he he's a generation removed from his dancers he's no longer a part of them and that that was really troubling to him yeah, I mean, I think there was something about the 60s um, that was just sort of foreign to his character and mm-hmm. he, he, you know, and to his project. I mean, it, it, the project required, I mean, as you know, right, a, a very d- deep commitment and it required commitment from everybody, not just from him. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea that that would be sort of disrupted by politics or um, sort of the culture of the 60s was was really hard for him. I mean, he Mm -hmm. really didn't like hippies. He really didn't like, you know, and he was very conservative in Mm -hmm. in those ways. I mean, that that seemed all, you know, the 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 60s revolution in the United States seemed to him a little too close to communism. I mean, mm-hmm. not that it was, because it really wasn't, but <laughs> you know, he, he just wasn't, it, it was distracting his dancers. Mm-hmm. It was distracting them. You know, he'd walk across the plaza, one dancer told me, and they'd be lying on the ground, you know, protesting the Vietnam War, or a little bit later in the 70s, especially, um, the late in the early 70s and he would just say get up that's not what we do here this is not about politics mm-hmm. you know get up come to work what are you doing yeah right yeah i wonder not i just like wonder that made michael and i think like how much of that could be happening similarly today where there's just a generational divide between you know, the people who are running companies and then the dancers, it's just the dancers are young. That's just always how it's going to be. And as the leadership um, maybe ages a little bit, are we seeing that divide kind of similarly now? Yeah, I mean, I can't really speak to the present because I'm not in touch enough with the the inside workings of the companies. But Mm -hmm. uh, but it's certainly true that, you know, I'm thinking sort of moving the other way back into into his youth that he was at odds with the Imperial Theater and with mm-hmm. his own past there. It's not like he came out of Russia thinking, uh, you know, like the, like many white Russians, and he wasn't a white Russian because he wasn't aristocratic, but, mm-hmm. but, you know, he didn't come out of Russia thinking the Bolsheviks are bad, the Tsar was good, we want to get back to that. You know, he mm-hmm. didn't. That not at all. You know, mm-hmm. he was really joined the revolutionary avant-garde and the culture of that moment. And he started this youth ballet, to your point, right? And right. and and was it was a collective. You know, they were all if, if somebody was in trouble, they all pitched in. If somebody mm-hmm. had a medical problem, they all pitched in. It was a, a kind of like we're gonna work together towards something new. Mm-hmm. We, to be progressive we want it not to be you know we shot the past Mayakovsky right they he would just say things like that we shot that you know all is new stop and marvel they they were interested in moving on mm-hmm. 
Right. Yeah. The you know, is, even, I, under the, even under the Bolsheviks weren't so happy with that. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. <laughs> you know, another thing that I think you really bring to life and expand upon in a way that I hadn't ever realized was just how, how young and how serious, um, how serious Balanchine's health problems were at a young age. And again, it's something that like you feel like, I feel like, you know, Maria, Maria tall chief and six Balanchine ballerina says, you know, George had one lung and, you know, and then that's it, you know? Um, and the way that you describe it, it just really puts in to a clear picture, like how precarious this was and, and all of Lincoln's panickings and, you know, that like really George could have died at any point. Absolutely. I mean, in those early years, especially, I mean, he had TB and he was quite ill at various moments and he had all kinds of other ailments that would just come upon him for his whole life. I mean, he had an extraordinarily strong constitution to live through what he lived through, but I think he felt you know, that he, he could have died, should have died many times. Mm -hmm. And that was part of the, you know, the, like, what's, what's the matter with now? You might be dead tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Right. In his case, right. it, was, it was not just a, it was not just something to say. Right. That's how he had experienced it. And he had really been alone at, sitting alone with the possibility of death, you know? So he, mm -hmm. at a young age, had that kind of perspective which is something that people, you know, who experience exile often are sort of thrown to the, through a whole life very quickly. Right. right. Perspective. Yeah. I think the first time you mentioned that was like before he even left Russia when he was still a young boy. And it's like, what if he had, what would, you know, Bali have been like, it's, it was the first time, like you said, Michael, like I just hadn't thought about it before. Like what if he had, what would the world have looked like? Like at every turn, there is just another, it's all just chance. Like there were so many options for this not to have happened. And yeah, no, exactly. It's so contingent. I mean, this is, we all think of it as, oh my God, it's an New Valley. It was kind of inevitable. You know, his talent mm -hmm. was so great and his genius was so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. But it almost failed. He almost died. It almost failed. And it continually almost failed. Even mm -hmm. once the New Valley was, was established in the late 40s, it, right. it was still like a you know something that was tottering on the precipice for mm -hmm. right. a couple of decades yeah. before the Lincoln Center and the whole thing became more established. Yeah. And, and and you also deal so well with like the irony of once it's established is that then that's when George starts having these really um, you know deep uh, emotional issues. Of course, the whole um, you know Suzanne Farrell saga, uh, but as we've already discussed his issues with kind of becoming more separate from the dancers than he'd ever been and his aging. And it's just, you know, I guess that's just how, how life works. You finally yeah, feel. It was also, I think it was also that, you know, success, we, you know, we assume because we, we just do a lot of the time or most of us do that. That's what he was after is success. Mm -hmm. I don't actually think he was, he, his success was kind of a threat. Mm -hmm. He was after success because he wanted to be able to pay his dancers and have a stable company to work with, you know, and not have to constantly worry about money. Although he, he himself said some of our greatest work came out of our poverty, you know, mm -hmm. but, but he really, I think was a very, um, almost a kind of bohemian type in that sense. And, but it's a more Russian version of it. And, he, 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 success was something that might kill your talent. It was something you might settle into. It was a kind of, it might create an everydayness. It might sort of clog you or sort of bear down on you in a way that, you know, so his impulse was always to start over, do it again, do something, right. make something off balance, put, put people at ill at ease, you know, make the dancers sit up straight and mm. go, oh, what? Right. You know, otherwise, right. everybody's just kind of going along and, and you lose the that edge that he was always after. So some of the chaos that you you illustrate in the book that is happening behind the scenes, maybe in a way, like he was drawn to that chaos. Oh, completely. I think so. I yeah. think so. Yeah. I mean, he didn't believe in the perfectly rehearsed dance, right? It's sort of Suzanne Farrell, you know, I rehearse options, right? not, not perfection, right? It, it, mm -hmm. The idea was to 
perfection was the the enemy, just the way being established was the enemy in that sense, right? It was, mm-hmm. it was, it was something that threatened the here and now spontaneous moment where you know. Um, like you said to Diana Adams once, you know, I don't care what steps you do, just do something interesting. Right. So there was nothing about, it has to be these steps exactly this way. There were musical moments that had to be exactly this way. Right. And they knew, but there was a lot of freedom in, in how you got to those and how you, how you parsed the music between those moments. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. To circle yeah. back to his childhood again, another one of the things that um, struck me, and, and again, Michael and I were talking about, we haven't read a lot of these books like Suzanne's book, the Allegra's book in years. Like we read them at the beginning of our career. So it was, it's reignited our curiosity and we want to like go back and consume them all again. But um, one of the things that I guess I had forgotten was just about how important religion was to him as a child, not just, you know, how involved his family was in religion. And so did you find any ways in particular that... Um, that influenced his creative process down the road that maybe you weren't aware of before. Yeah. The, re- the religion piece was a very um, absorbing to me and much deeper than I had thought. I knew that mm-hmm. he was a very religious man. I mean, we all knew that, but, mm-hmm. but I thought that meant really that he had grown up in this Russian Orthodox church and that that's where his faith was. And, and all of that was true. And the question of icons and, the world that he lived in, this Russian Orthodox world, um, you know, not a world, but he was, he was, as you say, there were family connections into it and he was fascinated with it as a child, with its theater and its spectacle and its, its rituals. Um, but the, the whole, his interest in, in the divine and in, mysticism and in Sufism and in um, pretty much anything he could get his hands on, on the, you know, in the, he knew the Bible so well, Mm -hmm. especially the New Testament. And he, he was constantly sort of referring to that, especially in the early years. And I think it was a, a, a key kind of philosophical outlook for him because he was very interested in service and the idea of service, you know, not my ego, not me, not you, the dancers expressing yourself. We're going to get rid of that. I and get rid of that ego. And we're going for something higher, a more elevated experience. That's going to be really a sort of way of, moving things into, you know, he talked about the fourth dimension and a kind of realm that is a little bit more, as he put it, you know, mm-hmm. than the everyday that is a, a, where our project is different. And that all had to do with, with the sort of religious cast of the company he was building. And the dancers all said, so many of them said to me, it was like a religion. They would say, it, you know, right. really independent of one another. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I pushed them. What was it all about, right? It was like a religion. Yeah. Mm. How do you think he reconciled certain details of his life? Of course, he famously had many wives and, you know, dated many other dancers or was involved with other dancers. That's one aspect. And then ballet in and of itself, especially at that point, could be viewed as um, something that a religious person should not be involved in. Um, How is he making that come together in his mind with his with his um you know faith yeah no i mean it's a it was a it 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 turned out that was a key question for him Mm. i didn't quite understand that when i started that he that he was so because one of the myths about balanchine is it's you know don't talk do Mm -hmm. uh, don't think dear just dance that kind of thing right you know that there was a somehow um uh, an anti-intellectualism to it and Um, I think there was a reason for that, which we could talk about, but in fact, he was extremely well read and he was, and he was very concerned about, he was especially well read in theology and then Lincoln called him an amateur theologian and he wasn't wrong, you know, that, and those were the books on his shelf. And so far as we know, what was on his shelf, there were a lot of books about, um, theology and spiritual, spirituality, um, 
So, you know, and then I found these choreographic notes and this was the key for me because they were, they were little bits of paper that he had scribbled on for an article that was written in the late forties. Um, and, and, you know, his English still wasn't that good at that point. So it was actually kind of written by someone else, but these notes were there and they were in his hand and they really you piece them together, you get a picture of somebody who's trying to figure out through reading, in this case, Spinoza and Goethe, um, what it is for the, what is the body? Is it, is it, is it just a, a, a physical thing? No, for him, he wanted the body to be, he wanted a justification for his own art. You know, was it, what was he, was he doing something godly? And he thought he was, but he was looking for something that would help him see it that way. And so even Spinoza's idea of, of um, you know, de, Deo sive natura, God is in, in nature. It's in everything. It's in, it's in the human body. The body is not less than the mind. It's not less divine than the mind. And, and I think this was a great comfort to him, you know, and he, he talked about it, you know, we're, we're, we're like flowers in the field. What's wrong with that? <laughs> That's not against God. That's a, so this idea of service. And I think he really felt that his own gift was God given. Hmm. I wonder, um, you know, there's been some discussion. You mentioned the dancers saying it was kind of like a religion that would put him as kind of like the god of the organization. There's been discussion surrounding that, criticism surrounding that. I just wonder what your takeaway is. Is was it more like that than you thought originally? Less so. What? Where does it leave you now thinking about? Well, that? you know, I mean, there's a there. You know, it's, the question is kind of like to push your question a little further is even, um, you know, was it a cult, right? Was it a cult? Was it a, and, and it had some cultish aspects to it for sure. But I would say really only sort of in the sense of cultic practices in a way, the cult part, I just couldn't buy because, you know, cults are usually about uh, deifying an individual and they did, Mm -hmm. you're right. They did talk about him like he was some kind of, but that's not how he thought about it. And that's not mm. think, how they ultimately experienced it because he was quite humble, in fact. Mm-hmm. He wasn't some kind of megalomaniac or, you know, egotistical um, leader who had everything. He, he actually dispensed authority quite effectively mm-hmm. and wanted right. other people to have control and be in charge. You know, you, you're good at that. You do that. And then they would just go off and do it, whatever they did. If he didn't like it, he would tell them. Certainly, he was an autocrat. But yeah, <laughs> but I don't think it was it was a cult. I think there were things about it that were very difficult for lots of people, and there, you know, it's it was a strange place for mm-hmm. sure. Not your yeah. usual workplace, as as we would say today, right? Yeah, and the yeah, politicians I- were different than than people expect today. Right. And I think that's, I think you do a really good job of that as well. I mean, a lot of people, I think just today, generally, it's um, as we we are making huge social changes in the workplace and just in the world at large, like, I think the tendency is to want to judge the past by today's standards. I don't know, maybe that's something that is historically, you know, happened before, but it definitely feels like today that's really a lot of the outrage and things but but it is you know you are it does make one wonder it's like well i mean in the 60s where people still like this man is 60 and suzanne is 19 and this is very weird and you know you you do delve into all of that and i'm and um and the people that were hurt along the way because when we get into the myth of balancing we we tend to you know trim that fat off and are like well he's you know he's this great choreographer and he gives his ballerinas perfume and it's so lovely you know <laughs> so it's it's interesting i'm just i guess i just want to talk a little bit about the the dismantling whether intentional or not of of certain myths about balancing and how you kind of went about that like the sensitivities of people and all of that 
I mean, the whole question of the women and the age and the, the youthfulness of so many of the, you know, of dancers and and his pursuit of them, both artistically, but also socially and at times sexually, you know, was something that I, I just felt that my job was was to lay it out and mm-hmm. not to shy away from anything that happened. If it happened and I had good evidence that it happened, then I, I put it down. I wrote it. And, and so I, I saw it as, as like a, a little bit like cold from the outside, you know, like right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say what happened. And it's not my job as a historian to necessarily, it's possible, but I didn't want to do this to moralize about it and to right. make judgments about him. I mean, people can do that. Anyone can do that. They can read the book and they could do that. My job was to say what happened. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. say it with, as accurately as I could and to be um, you know fair in that way and truthful about what I saw and and also to try to represent what it was to the players at the time I mean how mm-hmm. it's the same thing but not just the facts but how they felt about the facts mm-hmm. at the time I was just thinking when you're saying talking about the you know how they feel about the facts. What have been the receptions from dancers, maybe from people that gave you interviews? Did it end up differently than maybe they thought? Well, that you're going to have to ask them because I have <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> so, that's right. probably fine. <laughs> well, I think I think that's what's interesting and and um you know, like Rebecca said, we read all, of course, we read all the autobiographies, but that is one person telling them their tale and, you know, a fairly rosy light. Cool. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm sure that some, like a lot of these famous stories that we've read a million times, have, I mean, for me, they certainly revealed new details. And um, I just, you, yeah, you do wonder about how that person feels, but it, this is history versus you know, a person's own explanation of their life. Yeah. I mean, to be honest, I'm a very, um, I mean, when I'm behind my computer writing, I'm really just with like, what is it? What's the evidence? Where is it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. How do I it? I'm not thinking about how they're going to feel about it. Right. right. Well, yeah. Yeah. I imagine you can't. <laughs> I do. I never write anything, you know. Right. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> not a long time ago. You know, you have to just write what you think and what you know. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Were there and any. Of course, it's my story of Balanchine. It's not their story. It's my story. True. Their story. Right. right. Well, and I think what's interesting too is to see it all like again, we read an autobiography, we see one poem written to Suzanne, and then we read this book and we see like 18 creepy poems written like all in one <laughs> in one sitting, you know, like all at once. And so it's interesting to see it all pieced together and woven together in that way. Yeah. Um, I wonder if there were any, when we're talking about myths, were there any other myths that you maybe felt like were busted for you during this experience of writing this book? I mean, the main was one had to do with the, with the sort of relationship in, in, I guess there were two things. One is the, the question of music and the question of music had always puzzled me because this whole idea that he would walk in the room and it would, as so many people said, you know, pour out of him. Mm-hmm just seemed to me so like magical. Like, how could that happen? These are like, these are astonishing pieces of work. Right. How do they just pour out of you with the dancers? Right. Working with the dancers. And, you know, as I did more and more work on it and started to look at the actual scores that he used and the ways in which he he had actually transposed the scores, often worked on them for years before he did Mm -hmm. the dances, he had a whole analytic process that was happening long before he got into the studio. And I guess that was known, but I hadn't understood how deep that analytic process was and how hard it was. Mm -hmm. And he'd talk about it at times, you know, somebody has to do this and it's me and it's not easy to figure out how. So what I came to understand was that the, 
the the dances were actually scores of their own in their own right, not just very skillful dancing to music. Mm-hmm. Actually, sort of musically driven scores of steps. And I were, I got a lot of this from musicologists working on this. You know that there, it's like two scores together, and they're interwoven. Mm-hmm. And he's one interweaving into the score. Right. You know, yeah. interesting. So, so that was pretty interesting. And then the other thing had to do with with words, which was a big thing for me because I'm a person of, um, you know, my craft is in words. And I had one of the reasons I was wary of writing about uh, dance and and especially about Balanchine was that I wasn't sure that words would be sufficient, and that and I was also I, I thought even maybe words might destroy it. Mm-hmm. Where it might just be just not helpful at all. And so, and and then as I started to read and understand how involved Balanchine himself was in words, that actually helped me in a way. You know, I could, there was, there was a, a sort of very thinking analytic mind, actually the deeply educated and very well-informed um about art, about literature, about music. He, he was, he, he really was vast, right. you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, an, another area that I think you cover in a way that I've never um, read about before is just going through the relationships with each of the wives. And then in particular, how he and Tanny connected. And I'm, to me, that was so interesting because you might think, you know, that they have the the most vast age difference, and um, you know, it's it's as he's starting to finally establish himself. But it was so interesting that like the the way that they worked in a way that had not previously happened with any of his other wives. And how did you kind of get to the crux of like what each what his relationship was with each one of these women? I mean through interviews, through knowing them. I knew Danilova, I knew Tall Chief. I did not know Tani. Um, you know, uh, uh, the earlier wives, of course, I didn't know. I mean, Tamara Chief, I didn't know. Zarina, I didn't know. Um, you know, the bits and pieces, right? Interviews with other people, uh, in case of Zarina, the letters that he had written to her, especially, um, research in, it's really that. It's just, Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many notes I had and, you know, Mm -hmm. sitting on the floor, like I would have them lined up, you know, that piece from there, this one from there, this one from across the country, this one from all these different bits and then Mm -hmm. what does it make when you put them together? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I guess the reason I'm curious about that in particular, uh, for me, I imagine that that, that exploring those romantic relationships and the depth of them might be more difficult than other aspects of the book. Is, is there an aspect of the book that was harder for you to get to like the core of? Yeah, no, that certainly is, is one of them. You're right. Because Mm -hmm. those intimate relationships, right. People don't often talk as Mm -hmm. easily. That or or share, but but they did share, and <laughs> some of them have written books about it, you know. So right, 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 and and you can, uh, you know, I tried, I didn't surmise really, but I I, you know, when somebody builds you a pink house, there that tells you a lot, right? <laughs> yeah, with no front door. With no front door, <laughs> unbelievable, right? <laughs> um. I wonder about all these notes that you're talking about, diaries. Um, some of this, I assume, you knew was in existence. Was there anything that you found once you set off um, to research everything that was like a gold mine? Maybe there were a few things. Oh, there were several things. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, there were several things that were given to me by people who, you know, just, I suppose the most important one was a series of tapes that of Balanchine um, talking about his own life. And that was... You know, that was sort of solid gold. Um, right. Who gave those to you? Those came from uh, from the um, from a previous biographer. Ah. An wow. So, you know, that I also did that. I mined the 
the you know, Richard Buckles archives, for example, or in, or in uh, Texas in Austin at the at the um, Ransom Center. So I was, and they're not cataloged even, but I went through them all. And, you know, you get things because they were first. They gave, mm -hmm. they had interviews with people that were dead by the right. time right. they came around, things like that, right? So, wow. yeah, so they are, they, the, it, it's so much fun to be a historian because you get <laughs> just, you know, it's like being a, a, a spy or something. You get yeah. to you know, try and yeah. find these things and get it's 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 hard but it's but it's um it's fun i mean i i also there's something about living with one person in your mind for so many years mm -hmm. you know i mean i really was thinking about balancing most of the day every day for 10 years wow. you know so i i got to know him in that way too just in the sense of I was just living with the, whatever evidence I could have as it piled up around me, you know, mm -hmm. I was just in him. And so I was always trying to figure him out. Why would he have done that? Why did he do that? Mm. Yeah. It's like the yeah. project of a novelist in a way, because you've got yeah. a, it's a real person, but that person is no longer there to speak for themselves. So mm -hmm. there must, I just can't even begin to imagine how much, you know, that is not in the book. I mean, if you just made like uh, volumes of all of your notes and research, <laughs> I mean, thousands I've got of pages. I've got to archive myself now. It's true. <laughs> I, bet. I bet. Yeah. Is yeah. there anything in particular? I'm sure a lot of things had to be taken out of the book just for a very various reasons. Not everything can make it in. Is there one thing in particular um, that you really wanted to include, but it just didn't work out? Um, I'm sure there is. But I can't think of it now. I don't know out. what it would be. All yeah, the good tidbits are in there. I already, I've already processed it as, as this is it. You know? Right, right, right. You can't yeah, go yeah. back oh, now. It's, it's, I can't. it's I not, can't. it's not Sarah. Not you, you're not going to go back like Sarah. Not and edit it and add it and no, you know put the yeah. put the Russian dance. Yeah, all that right. And there's yeah. and there were so many. I guess that would be the answer. There were so many dances that I couldn't. Mm. I had to choose because otherwise, the, I mean, the book is already long and I couldn't include everything. And uh, so I left very important things out. And yeah. Yeah. I love that. But it's very clear to the reader, to me, at least is like why, I mean, how the, all of those ballets, they relate to his life. Like you, you do spend time on ballets, for instance, um, uh, you know that he that only had one performance or like you know where we're something that we're lo that's lost that is no longer performed and but they all relate to the larger picture of his life it's not just like you know so maybe something more major it gets less noticed but it's because like uh you know requiem mechanicals like that was important to the 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 zoomed out look of what was going on for him then yeah. Right. I mean, it was a judgment. These were judgment calls and they were, um, you know, I may or may not have gotten it right, but it, and I, I certainly wasn't trying to, I mean, this was in a way the biggest problem that I faced with the book is how do you write about the work in the life without reducing it to the life? So I was careful not to choose dances that would like fit the life in a sense of mm -hmm. oh, that's an oh oh got it you know that works easily that and because i'm very aware that uh, you know the sources of art are not always in life they can be in something completely independent of what's happened to you that day and in fact sometimes that's the most important because right. you're not trying and for balancing especially he wasn't certainly trying to tell the story of his life and his work but on the other hand these works come at a specific moment in a person's existence. And so mm -hmm. you can't say that they don't somehow relate in some way. Right. So right. that sort of line, I was always trying to be pretty, um, I was trying to be as subtle as I could and as, as sort of fair as I could to which ones were more easily interpreted. Mm -hmm. And there is an interpretation going on here, of course, but um, other people might not see these dances entirely as I do. Right. right. 
Um, so, yeah, I wonder, um, so you've spent 10 years on this, you have countless and countless notes, you have this whole archive, is there any question that was left unanswered or something you just couldn't quite grasp even after all of your extensive research? That's a good question. Um, I mean, I would have liked to have known more about his mother. Mm. Certainly, I would have liked to have known more about, um, and I'm not the first person to say that. Um, it, it's funny. I also felt this is a, this is this was an odd experience for me because you know the, the there's no period in this whole span more documented probably than the 20s in Paris by other you know, by various historians and and mm-hmm. writers. And certainly Diaghilev has been very well written about by many people. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet it was the hardest part for me. And mm-hmm. I don't really know what happened to him. And I don't have a, I, I, I struggled with it a lot. It was, it was hard to get a feel for what he was really going through then. Because once he leaves Russia, he kind of disappears in a way. And mm-hmm. he's making stuff. But even that first year, we don't know what, what happened when he got off the boat. Mm-hmm. in Berlin or the, the uh, train in Berlin. Right. Mm-hmm. Pulling the train in Berlin. I, I just don't. But even still like that, the, I didn't, I don't even know that I had read much of anything about Berlin. And then you, it, it is very clear the influence of that period of, of his life had throughout his career. So it yeah. is, it's this hugely integral thing, but like to me, I just think of or previously, you know, I, I knew I would think of his time in of like, you know, in Paris or in Monaco or even in London and even Copenhagen. You know, I knew a little bit about, but Berlin was just nothing on my radar. Yeah. So it, what you came up with there is still like really eye opening to me. Yeah, no, that's where the history can help. Right. Because yeah. I knew he was there. Mm-hmm. And we know that. And, he, we, and we know from later ballets. We can see some of the influences from later work. And and he also said it was a very important period for him, you know, that he owed a lot to to the culture of Weimar Germany. Mm-hmm. So so that so I was able to fill it in from by by sort of reading it backwards. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. I wondered um you also present some like personal views kind of within the book. You have your own voice in there, here and there. And I wonder how you balanced that between the facts and then adding some of that extra finesse with within the book. I mean, look, to me, I, I just I do. I, what I did not want to do is write a book that was just, um, you know, one thing after another mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and and just like very factual and he did this, he did that, he did this, he did that. I mean, I felt that the the reason to write the book was try to bring the life alive in a in an almost sort of novelistic way, but that had some that had facts behind it. Mm-hmm. Right. And then to not um, and I think I got better at this as I went along, but not to but to do it in my own voice. And yeah, really not shy away because otherwise, what you know, why bother, right? Mm-hmm. I, right. I thought, well, you know, if I don't say what I think, then you only live once, right? It's like going on <laughs> stage without, without, <laughs> and kind of just like tiptoeing around, you know. Right. <laughs> we're doing the steps, but we're not <laughs> doing anything. We're kind of doing them, but we're not going to say anything about them. We're going to just right. do them. <laughs> I like that, but it's your understanding of ballet and your love and your deep that it's within you as well that makes you able to speak like that, you know, and, and that, and it really comes across and it feels, it makes it feel so much like a, a true story instead of like a history book, you know? Oh, good. I'm glad. I mean, look, I came to see, I came to believe that, um, you know, the, the book begins in, in a sort of series of disrupted facts, you know, the illegitimate death, the, uh, the illegitimate birth, the, the whole, the sand, the sand makings, as we were mm-hmm. talking about earlier, mm-hmm. and it ends inside a ballet. And the, and those are, you know, so it, 
it, it has a, a grounding in facts and reality and all of those things. But what I came to understand was that the real world for Balanchine was not the real world of everyday life and mm -hmm. material things that we all uh, spend so much time thinking about. But this really, he really was a kind of mystic and a metaphysics. There was a metaphysical world that he was living in that had to do with the theater and being in that theater every day and mm -hmm. whatever was going on, the, you know, the real, real world of the stage and the ways in which that, which is after all a fiction, was the, the real thing. So, you know, that's why the Quixote figure is so important for me. And I think it was important for him for those reasons too, you know, that there's, there's a kind of s s sliding of realities and there's a slipperiness to, to time and to um, truth that, um, that he was very involved in. Mm -hmm. I am hesitant to wrap up the interview because it's so good, but I, I do. Um, I have a couple more questions before we do. And one, one would be if there is just, is there something, a ballet maybe, or a moment in time where you could be a fly on the wall, like a, a lost ballet or just a, an actual moment that you wish you could have witnessed that it was not tangible for you. Yeah. The, um, uh, the ballet I would love to see is Opus 34. It is one of those dances, which just shows you in no uncertain terms, just how avant-garde he was and how much he was always pushing the envelope. You know, we think of him today often as somebody who is classical or neoclassical, but he right. said, you know, that's your word, not mine. And uh, he was always pushing the edge, even in the most tutu ballet classical dances. They're all off balance. They're all, you know, working with a, a, a sort of a, a tonal body. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. so there's something really um, different about what he was doing. And it was a new kind of dance and a new kind of body. It still feels that way, even as we're watching now, you know, it, yeah. it does. Yeah. I wonder also, um, like looking back over this whole experience, what's your main takeaway? Do you experience his ballets differently? Maybe when you're in the audience now, what's the takeaway for you? What's the takeaway? I mean, the takeaway for me, I suppose, is, is, is less about today and more about the the enormity and sort of the it's it's a kind of stunning ambition that he had and it's a it's a life that was lived through great suffering and tragedy and yet came out with immense beauty and pattern and devotion to people and there were a lot of um, strange creaturely things that that happened in that process, but it's sort of the the bigness of the life and the and the and the way it was rooted in both a political and a religious project. Mm -hmm. It was a dance project above everything else, a music project above everything else, but it was also a project about creating a world of spirit in reaction to a Bolshevik world of materialism, mm -hmm. you know, and to create his own world of spirit, a kind of revolution of spirit uh, with dancers in a, on a, a soil that was not his native soil. Um, and to endow it with a, with a kind of purpose that was larger than any of them, which is why I think it worked. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. It's almost unfathomable. It's just it, we like, you know, knowing the end of the story, the beginnings make, you know, you're like, okay, well that happened. But just if you actually go back and consider every step of the way, the way that you make us do the way that you make the reader do, it's just, it really challenged my whole idea of, of balancing. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
Yeah. yeah. We hope that all of our readers will pick up their copy. We'll have um, a link to it in the show notes of this episode. It's so wonderful. And again, like we said, just ignited so much curiosity and interest and in going back and reading all these stories again and maybe from a different perspective. But just before we let you go, what's the next 10 year project for you? What's coming up next? <laughs> I wish I knew. I don't know. <laughs> I can't tell you. I just, I'm not yeah, holding well, back. I just don't know yet. No, I'm we'll sure. let you breathe. We'll let yeah, you breathe. It's been take a little break. <laughs> yeah, take a little break. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. Well, thank you, Jennifer, so much for your time. We truly appreciate it. Thank you for doing this. It was, it's always fun to talk to you. So thank you.